Good morning, everybody. It's so wonderful to see so many familiar faces. Um, we're really excited to have uh, this presentation today, and I think Erin kind of laid it out nicely. Um, we're so delighted to have Pete Monzo, President and CEO of United Ways of California, to join us. So, um, a longtime friend and alum of CNM, and uh, he is joined by Henry Gascon, his Director of Program and Policy. And they asked that I don't read their bio, so you can go online to do that, because we really want to dig into the data. And those of you who know me know that I'm a big data nerd. And we're really excited, and I've already gone on your website and looked at the CSVs and everything, but um, we're really excited to hear what you've learned as you've taken a really deep and um, important dive into real costs and how it's impacting our communities. So with that, I'll just jump right into it. Um, we're going to start with the presentation, and we'll be monitoring the chat for questions and allow some time for questions at the end. So with that, thank you so much. It's an honor and privilege to hand it over to Pete. Oh, uh, thank you, Mara. Um, uh, thank you all for being here. You know, Henry and I are very uh, eager uh, to get into this with you. Henry's going to um, uh, present the slides. Um, uh, I just want to say a few words at the top, and then we hope to say, have a lot of room for questions and answers, right? So um, as Mara mentioned, I'm the president and CEO for United Ways of California. Um, we work with the 29 United Ways throughout the state. Um, to help them accomplish their missions and to do things that they need to do together. So state level public policy, federal level public policy, and you know, aligning their programs across regions are things that we spend a lot of time doing. Um, and we produced this real cost measure study to help um, our United Ways across the state and their partners have conversations with communities about who is struggling and what are the barriers that they face in, in moving up? And what can we as a community do to help them? Um, and so that's the purpose behind producing uh, the real cost measure study. Um, you know, we believe everyone deserves an opportunity to achieve the building blocks of a good life, uh, to a chance to have a quality education, to, to enjoy good health, uh, to be financially stable. Um, and we believe that expanding opportunity to do these things is um, key part of our mission, right? Um, so one of the reasons that we produce the real cost measure is we believe that to help struggling families, you know, gain agency, live with dignity and have upper mobility, we need a poverty measure that points the way to a decent standard of living. Not something that just tells us how low incomes are relative to others, which unfortunately is what we think that most poverty measures do. They just tell you how much money people don't have. They don't necessarily tell you where we would want them to be. What are our aspirations for those families? Um, so that's a key reason that we produce the real cost measure. And in doing it, what we do is we look at what a decent standard of living costs in every California county. And then we analyze how many families in each county and each neighborhood cluster um, don't earn enough to meet that decent standard of living, right? So we can see what the gaps are and we can also see who they are, right? Are these immigrant families, are these um, you know, families with young children? Are they led by single moms? You know, these are the things that we wanna um, try and get a sense of. So if you can see people's situation more clearly, you're more likely to be able to help them. So with that, um, you know, uh, I think probably Henry, it's time to tee up the uh, slides and we'll get into this. Um, we wanna encourage you guys, uh, if you are comfortable, uh, with social media, um, you know, to post about this session or what you learn here. Um, you know, we use the real, the hashtag real cost measure. Um, and we know in the nonprofit field, real cost means something else sometimes. It can mean nonprofits actually getting paid the true cost of delivering services. Um, and then our um, uh, two, the, the hosts here today are, you know, CNM SoCal, that's their Twitter handle, at CNM SoCal and at United Ways CA um, is, uh, is ours. Um, and uh, and I, um, so we encourage you to post, uh, put questions in the chat. We're gonna save a lot of time for questions at the end. And then Henry is gonna get us started with a, a quick little exercise. Um, Henry? Great, thanks so much, Pete, for the introduction. And, and thank you to the Center for Nonprofit Management for hosting us this morning. Like Pete, I also used to work at the Center for Nonprofit Management for several years. 
And it's great to see all of the wonderful work that they're doing to serve the Southern California nonprofit sector. So thanks so much for joining us today. So um, my name is Henry, and I'm gonna go ahead and talk about the findings for our real cost measure study. So the first thing I want you to do, however, is to think about your own neighborhoods that you live in, in LA County or wherever else that you may be joining us from today. Think of, imagine yourself as part of a family of four with two adults, one preschooler and one school aged child, okay? Your own neighborhood, family of four. And in the chat box, go ahead and share how much would this family of four that you're part of spend monthly on housing? Just go ahead and give us a ballpark estimate. Family of four in, the, in the, your own neighborhood that you live in, one preschooler, one school aged child. And Pete, if you don't mind, would you mind just shouting out some of the estimates that, were, that are coming in? Yes, Henry. Um, so we're seeing some, you know, <laughs> ranging from 2,400 a month to 4,000 or 5,000 a month. Um, yep. you know, uh, it's uh, quite substantial. I see a, a $1,200 estimate, 6,000 a month. Um, a lot of good answers here in the chat. Right. What about childcare? I don't know, what does this family of four in your neighborhood spend monthly on childcare on average? One preschooler, one school aged child. Seeing uh, 1,500. 2,000, 1,000, um, yeah, at least 2,000 a month, 2,500. Great. 3,500, yeah. What about, great. What about food? Feeding this family of four in your neighborhood on, on food, what would be those, what would be that monthly cost? Foods uh, coming in at like, 600, 800, 1,000, 1,200. It's a little bit less than you know, child care and housing. Eight, 900. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. What about health care? How much would this family of four in your neighborhood sp spend monthly on health care? And don't worry, this isn't going to end up to be a monopoly game or anything. So we're just getting <laughs> yeah. some. So uh, we're just getting some monthly costs in terms of whatever. Two hundred with insurance, five hundred to employer, five hundred plus, four hundred, maybe two to five hundred for for medical. Right. right. Okay. Good. Transportation. Medical. Family of four, and it you know doesn't matter if you're thinking about private transportation if there's a couple of cars in the household. You could even incorporate the cost of public transportation. Um, you could include maintenance, gas, whatever uh, transportation related expenses come yeah. your way monthly, just ballpark. Seeing some, you know, 1400 to 400, 800, um, you know, 550, 1500 to 2000, mm -hmm. depending on gas mileage. One hundred, two hundred dollars. And lastly, yes, yeah. Go ahead. Great. And lastly, what about miscellaneous? Everything else. What are some of the other household costs cost that you would approximate aside from all these other basic needs that we just mentioned above? Uh, three hundred, seven hundred, five hundred, a thousand, thousand to fifteen hundred, a thousand, five hundred. Yeah. Yeah. So it really depends in terms of how this family of, of four really kind of functions and what what their lifestyle is like, and obviously, and also what kind of neighborhood that they live in as well. Okay. So let me talk about the real cost measure. And the real cost measure, first of all, is a, is a far more accurate measure of who is struggling in California. So many of you may be pretty familiar with the official poverty measure that we pretty much use every day in terms of this. Uh, low-income families and their challenges to make ends meet. But not too many people know in terms of what the official poverty measure is comprised of. And it was originally founded during Lyndon Johnson's war on poverty during the 1960s. And obviously, if you're going to declare a war on something, you need some sort of an instrument to measure it by. So very famously, Molly Orshansky within his uh, Social Security Administration 
looked at the cost of food because that was one of the biggest household expenses for many families during the 1950s and 60s. So for all intents and purposes, we're still using that formula for our official poverty measure. It's just been adjusted for inflation ever, ever since. So the official poverty measure doesn't take into account the cost of housing, healthcare, childcare, transportation, and other basic needs for a realistic standard of living, um, both throughout California and throughout the rest of the country. And, and the official poverty measure al also doesn't treat poverty the same way as it does in Alabama or California. So it doesn't take into account geographical differences in terms of the cost of living. So the real cost measure does. We incorporate all these basic needs and the geographic cost of living. So we can actually distinguish between what the cost of living looks like in Fresno County versus LA County, Shasta County, and other parts of California. And the primary focus of the real cost measure is on working households. And we're realizing that wherever you live in California, most of the families that are below the real cost measure have at least one working adult. And we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. In addition to county and state level data, the real cost measure also features regional data. So we can look at the San Francisco Bay Area, for example. We can look at Southern California as a whole. But I think the real value lies within neighborhood level data. And a lot of the federal poverty measure or other studies that you might have seen over the past several years only look at county level data. But we think it's really critical to take a look at neighborhood level data. LA County, if it was its own state, not that we're advocating for that, would probably be the eighth largest state in the union, which obviously has big electoral, electoral vote ramifications if it was its own state. But it's not, it's part of California. But we can actually tell the neighborhoods in LA County and see how they fare within the real cost measure from Santa Monica to Alhambra. And as part of this analysis, we actually calculated 16 household budgets for all 58 counties in California, going all the way up to 20 adults in a household. So we individually calculated that to actually look at the cost of living and depending on family size and depending on geography. I'm not gonna wonk out too much on all of the data sources that we use to calculate the real cost measure, but to primarily tell you that, we're, uh, that we've used completely publicly available government resources to calculate what it costs to live in California. And the, the, we've, what we try to do is focus on the minimum standard that a household needs to make ends meet. But we know in some cases, the cost of living is, is certainly higher. And that is evident with the cost of housing. So we look at fair market rent rates by HUD um, and that's usually kind of the, on the 40 per, 40th percentile of gross rents. And it's also used to determine the Section 8 um, ho housing vouchers, for example. So it's a bare bones budget, right? The cost of food, we look at the low cost food plan by, the, by HUD, by the House, Department of Housing and Urban Development. For health care and transportation, we use the consumer expenditure survey. And we use uh, state data to look at the cost of child care throughout California and look at taxes, how robust this is in terms of our ability to go ahead and incorporate the cost of federal taxes, state taxes, payroll taxes, and child care and child care tax credits in terms of what it costs to live in California. So obviously this doesn't include other basic needs like utilities isn't on here as well. That's often difficult very for, for us to calculate based upon the different utility companies that are, that are existing throughout California. And you notice things like broadband are, are so factored as, 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 a, as part of our calculations as well. So once again, this is a minimum standard in terms of what we think it, it takes to make ends meet in California. So based on this family of four with two adults, one preschooler and one school aged child, we've calculated that this family of four would have to earn about $95,000 in income annually to make ends meet. So that's a big challenge, and not many families throughout LA County can do that. In fact, most a lot of them don't. So let's take a look at what this income level looks like for a family of four below the real cost measure. And you can actually just see they get about almost fifty thousand dollars in wages. And obviously, how that family works varies from household to household. It could be one full-time working adult, it could be one adult working two to three jobs or it could be multiple house, household members working two to three jobs in a household, if not more. You can actually just see, you get a little bit from interest and other income, about $100 in average from CalWORKs, which is our version for temporary assistance and needy families program, a tiny bit for retirement on income, and, and even with the most successful anti-poverty programs that we have in the state, 
the earned income tax credit, which is about, about 2000 a month for this family of four, you could actually just see the huge income gap that the, this family of four would have to make ends meet. I'm going to just adjust my screen here so I can just see a little bit um, more clearly. And so this family of four would have to go ahead and uh, they face an income gap of almost 40, of, of over $43,000 to make ends meet. So the big question is, how do they do it? And the big answer to that is it really varies from family to family. Some would try to negotiate with their landlord um, on, on any given month to see if they can pay a certain amount this month and the rest next month. They would skip out on the cost of food or, or their prescriptions and other basic needs. Um, so, uh, so it's a big challenge for, ma for many families throughout LA County and throughout the entire state of California. So here's where those geographical differences kind of just really shed some light in terms of the cost of living. Um, and you can actually just see here, but the differences between Fresno County, Orange County, Contra Costa County, and LA County. And you can just see pretty much across the board, the cost of housing, the cost of housing and the cost of childcare are probably the two biggest barriers for families to make ends meet. And when we're talking about childcare, we're pretty much assuming that these families are using a licensed childcare facility. But in reality, we know many families can't afford that. So they often rely on family and friends. And unfortunately, some, in some cases, siblings take care of their other siblings to, uh, for, for, um, you know, for child care. But you can actually just see how the cost of living really varies from, from, uh, from county to county throughout California. So this family of four would have to earn over $120,000 in Contra Costa County versus about $70,000 in Fresno County to make ends meet. So the geographical differences are really important in estimating the cost of living. So let's take a look at three different family types here in LA County. On the first column, we have two adults. In the second column, we have the example that we just cited earlier, two adults, one preschooler and one school age child. And in the latter column, we have two adults, one school age child and one teenager. And you can actually just see how the cost of living really varies as families grow and evolve. Um, with, within their lifestyles and within their own specific generation. And you can actually see the big differences between the last two columns. Once that preschooler and school age child grow up to be a little bit older, once they become a school age child and teenager, notice how the cost of childcare really decreases. Um, and you can actually just see it goes from 90, that family of four would have to earn 95,000 um, uh, 5, a year, all the way down to 83,000 once they need less childcare. And if they're just two adults, um, the minimum that they would have to earn in LA County is about 54,000. So family size really matters and where you live really matters in California. So here's the primary finding from the real cost measure. And overall, we know with the official poverty measure, which usually ranges between 12 and 14%, pretty much on any given year in terms of our ability to make ends meet, we find, according to the real cost measure, that up to 33% of families, a third of the state, don't earn enough to meet basic needs. And when we quantify that, that's over 3.5 million households. So those are a lot of families who are struggling every single day to put food on their table, to figure out how they're going to pay for housing on any given month, and to reach all the other basic needs. So it's not only the fiscal anxiety that these many that these families face on a uh, on an everyday basis, it's also the, the the emotional and the psychological anxiety that they deal with every day in terms of um, trying to make ends meet and to and to pay all of their uh, financial bills. And here's another big finding: we find that up to 97 percent of households um, below the real cost measure have at least one working adult. And, and this is a primary finding because this tells us that these struggling households aren't just out there looking to take advantage of the public benefit system available to them. In fact, we just saw that even if they were able to take advantage of all the public, public benefits available to them, they would still struggle to make ends meet. So these are hardworking families working every single day in their attempt to take care of themselves and their children. In LA County, the real cost measure is even higher than the state average. We find up to 40% of families in LA County are struggling to make ends meet. If that's not an alarming figure, it should be. When, uh, when four in 10 households in, in, in LA County alone can't afford to make ends meet, and when we quantify that, that's over 1.1 million households just within LA County alone. That's 
that's a significant story that needs to be um, shared more and discussed more. So here's what the real cost measure has been has, has looked like over time. This July, we just released our fourth real cost measure study. The data goes through 2019, which is the most recent census data available. So obviously, we're going to be paying attention over the long term in terms of how the pandemic is actually shaping our real cost measure numbers, but that's going to be the, what we're going to be looking at for future studies. But for now, we find LA County has been pretty much consistent in terms of at least 40% of families struggling to make ends meet since at least 2014. So we can actually just see at, at its peak, it was 44% back in, in 2016. Here's what the state map looks like in terms of the degree of struggle, according to the real cost measure. And what we use to, at the neighborhood level data is what the US Census calls public use microdata areas. I just call them neighborhood clusters. And what they do is they consolidate neighborhoods that are contiguous to one another to reach a sample size of 100,000 people that is statistically significant. So these neighborhood clusters are far more statistically accurate than zip codes and census tracts. And the only thing census tracts are really good for, to be honest with you, is for county people during the, the, during the US Census. It, they have very little value in actually looking at in terms of socio, socio, socioeconomic data, because I haven't met anybody who even knows the census tract number that they live in. But people certainly understand neighborhoods. They understand the difference between Alhambra, Santa Monica, and all the other neighborhoods in LA County. So here are the two extremes. Only 11% of households in the community of San Ramon and Danville in Contra Costa County are struggling to make ends meet versus 80% of households in the community of East Vernon, right in the heart of South LA. 80% is an, is, is an uh, off the wall charts number that we should all be paying to in terms of how do these families make ends meet every single day? And, and this is a story that we really need to be talking about more in LA County. So here's the LA County map. LA County, because of its huge size, so I mentioned it would be the eighth largest state in the union if it was its own sovereignty, would, would have 69 neighborhood clusters, um, according to the US Census Bureau. Um, and here you actually just see the 1.1 million households that are struggling, right? And you can actually see the deep pockets of struggle that are, you can actually see in Lancaster and, and Palmdale, parts of the San Fernando Valley, but the real story is the heart of South Los Angeles, where we actually just see 80%, 80 uh, of up to 80, anywhere between 60 and 80% of households struggling right in the heart of, of, of LA County, compared to 12% of households in Redondo Beach, Manhattan Beach, and Hermosa Beach. So the difference between those two neighborhood clusters is probably a 25 minute drive on a good day, but you can actually see the, the hardship that exists between those two areas in terms of families to make ends meet. This is a huge story in terms of what we're seeing in LA County. When we look at the lens of ethnicity, which is obviously a, a significant topic for all of us right now, we find that 52% of Latino households in California are struggling to meet basic needs. That's easily the, heart, the highest um, ethnic group. When we quantify that, that's over 1.7 million households. And here's what it looks like in, in LA County. When we, and this kind of really mirrors a lot of the socioeconomic data and research that has been published over the years in terms of what we're seeing in terms of Latino households and African-American households struggling the most. But you can actually just see the degree of struggle within each of these ethnic groups where even 34% of Asian American households are struggling to make ends meet in LA County and 43% of uh, black households. However, when we turn that story around and when we actually put a number on it and not a percentage, look at how the story changes. Latinos uh, are, are still uh, the most struggling uh, ethnic group in LA County in terms of volume, but notice the second highest group. It's white households. And pretty much, this is a story that kind of mirrors not only what's going on in LA County, but throughout the entire state. While the percentage of, of households um, within each of the ethnic groups is certainly the, lar the largest among Latino and, and Black households, it's usually the white households who are actually second highest in terms of the degree of struggle um, throughout the entire state on average. We also look at the, at, at the lens between educational attainment and the real cost measure. So during the 1950s and 60s, when we had late, more labor protections and uh, more unions, um, a family could pretty much get by on a high school uh, diploma. Not so much anymore with the advancement of our society with, and with the need for more technical skills and specialized skill sets, right? So 
We find that up to 75% of households with, led by a person without a high school diploma are struggling to meet and struggling to make ends meet in, in LA County compared to about 42%, even with some sort of college degree, that could be one semester in a community college or, um, or, or even having a, a two-year two AA degree. But even notice those within bachelor's degrees. We even notice one in five uh, households um, with, headed by a person with at least a bachelor's degree are struggling to make ends meet. And this has actually caused uh, you know, researchers for a long time to actually question openly, you know, do we actually need a master's degree now to ensure a financial stability? And that's obviously subject for a lot of debate, um, but look at the data and how it's kind of just kind of just emphasizing the trend in terms of e even those with uh, high, but with master's degrees are struggling to get by. That's a sizable number. Another big factor is the intersection between citizenship and, and the real cost measure, right? So, um, so we look at pretty much um, tax filings to look at the data that's been that, that we use to calculate the real cost measure. And obviously, um, you know, immigrants don't, uh, a lot of immigrants don't, don't file their taxes, but we do have immigrants on non-citizens, naturalized citizens, citizens with a green card and US born citizens. And you can actually just see the differences there. And one of the things that we're, we're seeing, and, and I've heard from various testimonials, is the ability to speak English really goes a long way in terms of being able to access uh, social services in, 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 in any, no matter where you live in California. So in many cases, for families who aren't natively uh, English speaking, they often use their children to be their official translators in terms of being able to access social services and other programs that they may be eligible for. And this could include after school programs, um, learning about the earned income tax credit and, and other services that may be available to them and, the, and their families. Um, another big finding is the role of women with the real cost measure. And we're finding that 63% of households led by women fall below the real cost measure. So this could include single mothers. This could be um, households who are led by grandmothers and other types of caregivers. And overall, we find in LA County about 204, about four, two, over almost 244,000 households led by women are struggling to make ends meet in LA County. And if we take a look at how that contrasts with other types of conjugal households, it's really interesting kind of just to, to, to tell the story here. Even 50% of uh, households led by men um, are struggling to make ends meet. Um, and you can actually just see uh, the informal households too. By informal households, we pretty much mean households that are doubling up. And we see because of the high cost of living, uh, many families are doubling up themselves. Um, so we see 32% of families who are doubling up are struggling to make ends meet. And we're just even seeing with kids graduating from college is that they simply can't afford to go out and live on their own, right, as well. So often what they do is just come back to their parents because they can't afford the cost of housing or they'll try to double up with other friends who are probably in, in like-minded uh, like minded situations as well. Single mothers is a, a big story with our, with our real cost measure. And we're finding that almost 80% of single mothers in LA County are struggling to make ends meet. That is an incredibly high number. And when we quantify that, that's uh, almost 267,000 households within LA County. A big story right there. And another big challenge is for families with households with young children. Uh, so those households with children uh, with ages zero to five, primarily because of the cost of healthcare and, and other cognitive resources that they need, um, we find that 61% of households with children under the age of six are struggling to make ends meet. And when we quantify that, that's almost about 244,000 households right there as well. Um, of course, one of the biggest cost barriers to making ends meet in LA County is the cost of housing. And you know, for several years, maybe during the 70s and 80s, we thought that we should, really shouldn't be spending more than 30% of our income in housing. But now we're finding that up to, uh, you know, up to 44% of households in LA County are spending at least 30% of their income on housing. That's a figure that's well above the real cost measure. And when we quantify that, that's over 1.2 million households. Here's what the housing burden map looks like throughout the entire, entire state of California. And you can actually just see in terms of how this kind of mirrors is the cost of living with the state in general. And we see 22% of households in the community of the Intermission Castro District in San Francisco County um, pay at least 30% of their income on housing. And once again, coming back to the community of East Vernon, right in the heart of South LA, um, are starting to make ends meet. 
Um, one other thing I want to say about LA County is that of the 10 most struggling neighborhoods, according to the real cost measure in our analysis, uh, all 10 of those most struggling neighborhoods statewide are all in the heart of LA County, the South LA area and the San Fernando Valley area that are struggling the most statewide. And then here's the map in terms of the housing burden, right? So um, uh, we can actually just see the cost of living and how the how so many families are spending at least 30 percent of their income right pretty much throughout all of LA County, right in the heart, right in the middle of LA County, places like Lancaster, Palmdale, once again, San, almost the entire San Fernando Valley area, and most of, if not all, of South LA. And we pretty much find decide in terms of the lowest uh, in terms of Castaic and Lakewood, Cerritos, Artesian, Hawaiian Gardens, which is kind of an interesting finding, where only 34% 34, uh, 34 of those households pay at least 30% of their income on housing. Um, we're still trying, I'm still, I was pretty surprised to look to find that uh, the community of Lakewood, Cerritos, and Artesia, and our Hawaiian Gardens is uh, why the housing burden is so low. That's going to take a little bit more analysis on our end, um, but that was a, a founding that we just found, looked at last week compared to about 61% of, of households, once again, in the community of East Vernon, um, pay at least 30% of their income on household. So now that we've taken a look in terms of, you know, the income gaps for many of these families, let's take a look at the income, the, the actual income, when we look at med, uh, uh, statewide median earnings. So the statewide median earnings in California is about $92,000 in income, but you can actually just take a look at where the, how income really varies throughout the entire state of California. You can actually just see the high concentrated wealth in the San Francisco Bay Area, where over uh, the median uh, earnings there in Cupertino, Saratoga, and Los Gatos is well over 221,000, where and compared to uh, Bakersfield, where the median where the median income there is about forty-seven thousand dollars. So the story of kind of just who's who's able to make ends meet, who's, who has that earning potential. Uh, is also a big story throughout California. Here's what it looks like in, in LA County. And you can actually just see how this really mirrors the two previous maps of housing burden and the real cost measure maps earlier. So you actually see the, the lighter green areas indicate less income and the darker in areas indicate more, uh, more wealth. And you can actually just see uh, the, Northern Cal the Northern San Gabriel Valley region, which is kind of just above Duarte, Sierra Madre, Altadena, that kind of area, that's become a little bit more affluent that we've seen in our analysis over the past few years, where the meet, where the median uh, income there is about 151, uh, 151,000 compared to about 47,000 in, in, in the community of East Vernon, once again, right in the heart of, of LA. But you can actually just see the concentrated wealth in a lot of the coastal areas in Malibu, Pacific Palisades, and Calabasas, in contrast that with parts of South LA and even uh, parts of uh, Long Beach and El Monte and San Fernando Valley as well. So just to put this in, in a big context in terms of what's going on with the overall economy and our overall ability to make ends meet is that we find that since 1984, California's GDP, gross domestic product, which is the value of all goods and services produced in the state has increased by 155%. But median household earnings has only increased by 11% during that same amount of time frame, time, during that same amount of time. So we see the cost of housing continues to increase, the cost of childcare, transportation, all the other basic needs continues to increase. But notice how our income is pretty much flattened out. In fact, I think if we were to go back maybe to the middle of the 1970s, late 1970s, and, and just display, the, display this chart, I think this chart would pretty much look exactly the same. And the primary thing that this tells us is that the middle class hasn't gotten a raise in over four decades, but the price of goods and services continues to increase. Uh, another really helpful chart that Pete shared with me um, a couple a few years ago is data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. When we look at our overall uh, uh, productivity since the end of World War II, and you can actually just see our overall national productivity has been off the charts, increasing to 258% since 1948, but notice how our, hourly comp our, how our hourly compensation has pretty much flattened out since the late 1970s, which really speaks to the fact that the middle class hasn't gotten a raise in several decades. So um, just to kind of just wrap this up, and I'll turn it over to Pete, is that we don't, we don't re consider the real cost measure just a study that sits there on a shelf. We actually have a whole bunch of interactive tools and resources 
that we uh, talk about with the real cost measure, including a household budget calculator on our website. There you can actually go ahead and select the county that you live in, put in the age numbers of everybody in your household in terms of what it's, and it will tell you the minimum standard that that family would, would need to earn to make ends meet. We have an interactive Tableau dashboard, which has interactive maps at the county level and at the neighborhood cluster level. So you can actually go there and hover over any of those areas, your particular neighborhood as well. And it will show you what the real cost measure looks like there. We also have a public data set, which you can actually download on our, uh, on, on our website. So if you've done your own research, if you're using your own uh, 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 other partners research um, to look at some of the challenges within your own community, um, you can actually go ahead and download that public data, data set, which actually has neighborhood, all the neighborhood level data, which I mentioned today. And um, we're still uploading all the various press articles. Um, since we released our study in July, we've been fortunate enough to get 52 statewide media hits um, through various opinion articles and various uh, uh, news pieces that have come that have come over statewide. Um, and then how to use this, right? So a couple of things of how you can use this is a great grant writing tool for nonprofits, right? So you can actually be able to look at the real cost measure, look at the income challenges and the real cost measure within your own neighborhoods that you're serving and be able to justify a strong app grant application for many of you, many of you guys uh, members of the Center for Nonprofit Management. One of my favorite tools, of course, is it's a financial literacy tool. So one of the examples I kind of just frequently give is if you have a kid that's coming back from football practice or whatever, come at three o'clock in the afternoon, is really hungry, is sweating all over the place, opens up the fridge and pretty much empties everything else. It's six o'clock in the evening and people are, the rest of the family comes in, they're hungry too. They open up the fridge and notice everything's empty. This could be a general intervention opportunity to talk about you know, what, you would call, what you would pay for on food, housing and other expenses and get your kids going early with their own financial literacy. Um, so feel free to use this study as, as you wish. And uh, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Pete for some next, for next steps. Well, thanks, Henry. Um, you know, uh, I've been trying to answer questions in the chat, and so I think we've been keeping up with them. But um, now would be a good time to see if folks have any questions. And then um, if you don't, you know, maybe the thing to talk about is, you know, what can we do with this information, right? Um, how do we put it into use to try and help these uh, struggling families move up? This is such great data and thanks Henry for sharing it. It's Regina. Um, I'm sort of curious how you guys are thinking about advocacy efforts at this point, given that the data, especially for those of us operating in LA County is so dramatically depressing. Yeah. And with all the federal dollars and the state dollars and now county efforts around equity, it seems like maybe this is the moment. I'm just curious what you guys are thinking about strategies and next steps. I could share them. We have a couple of slides, you know, uh, we try not to, you know, we like to hear from people what their ideas are. Um, so I could share them in a, in a minute, That's but that's the essential question. Like, what can we do with this? Um, you know, uh, there are different levers you can pull, right? So I wanna suggest a couple. Um, you know, we know the housing burden is a big issue. And when we talk about racial equity, Right, we know that Black and, and Latino households are um, overrepresented in the renting households. You know, our country spends about three times as much supporting home ownership as it does supporting renters. But when you look at who who owns a home versus who rents, right, that's where you see a lot of our struggling households, particularly led you know households of color, are renting. Right, so what can we do to support renters is one question. Um, you know, we like the notion of a renter's credit. Um, you know, one of the things that we wanna, you know, um, emphasize, you'll often hear people say, well, one out of four kids in, in the US are growing up in poverty. We think that the statistics are worse than that. We know our data show that over half of households that have young children, zero to five. So this is when, you know, they, the most developmental gains, right? You know, we can set them up to be successful in life during that zero to five period. 
but over half of the households that have young children in California are struggling. Um, so what can we do with that, right? Um, what kind of support can we provide in terms of, you know, child care? Um, uh, this, you know, I can point to some bright spots, right? But we start to think about levers like that, um, if that makes any sense. And I'll stop to see if anybody has questions. I mean, if, if it's useful, I could just share the slides we have real quickly and show you the different levers and then we can have a conversation. Let me try and do that real quick. Um, so uh, one area is obviously, you know, preserving and expanding health coverage. That's been a bright spot in California. The Affordable Care Act has, you know, we've enrolled like two or three million more families in um, uh, uh, Medi-Cal uh, since, since 2014. The number of uninsured children has really dropped. And we've been taking steps lately to provide health coverage for undocumented adults, not just undocumented children, which we achieved three, four years ago, but undocumented adults over 50. Um, maximizing income support. So as Henry mentioned, these families are overwhelmingly working families, right? Um, they have a working adult in the household. Oftentimes they're working two or three different jobs, um, but their income varies. Right, it's it's so one week they have a, a lot of hours, the next week they may not. We see that's a big problem with a lot of uh, lower income families, and so income supports like the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit can be really key for them. CalFresh as well. Uh, I would say you know two things, two bright spots I want to mention. Right here in California, we and other advocates push for the creation of a state earned income tax credit. So that state earned income tax credit and the young child tax credit the governor proposed collectively now are putting a billion dollars a year into these struggling households pockets. So that's very important. Um, and also, you know, in the Biden administration, as we all are, know probably, we've vast, you know, greatly increased the um, value of the federal child tax credit. And if we can make that permanent, it's going to do a lot to, to help um, families move up. Um, expanding childcare, free or low cost childcare, that's a major issue. It's an economic development issue. It's an infrastructure issue, right? So a lot, you know, um, you mentioned that a lot, I think, sorry, we were talking earlier about the challenges a lot of nonprofits are having finding staff. And a lot of employers are saying, I'm having trouble getting people come work for me. A lot of that may be related to childcare, right? Um, uh, leveling up post-secondary education, you know, we our data show that as education income uh, education rises, people's incomes go up. So a lot of people are within a year of getting their high school diploma or their AA, or they didn't finish their BA. So if we take it from a glass half full perspective, we can just help people finish the last level they were at. That might be something that you know suggests itself as a good strategy. Um, you know, protecting households from predatory financial practices. I mean, I think we're all familiar with you know, uh, um, the prevalence of uh, payday lenders and the cycle of debt that they trap people in, whatever we can do to get them out of that, right? So CalSavers is a program that enables people uh, now to um, save for retirement, even though their employers don't offer a retirement plan, and they can borrow against it if they have to for rainy days. Um, we want to integrate and naturalize immigrants. We have a lot of undocumented folks living in California they're working hard, they're paying sales taxes and employment taxes, they're contributing to the economy, but you know, they are not, their lives would be very, and ours as a community would be much improved if we could you know, recognize their status uh, and integrate them, have them become citizens. You see that um, you know, uh, households led by immigrants do roughly as well as as households led by native born folks here in California. So that's that's one thing we can do. I mentioned increasing you know, support for renters. And then these last two are really hard, um, but um, the, you know, as Henry showed that one chart, right? Uh, American workers are very productive, but the gains from productivity have not been going to workers, they've been going to owners, right? Um, and you know, we've passed minimum wage increases in California. That's great. Um, 
but what else can we do to help workers? And so a lot of people, as I mentioned, work two or three jobs with variable hours, right? And they may not be getting benefits for any of them, or they might be driving for Uber or Lyft full time. They get no benefits for that, right? And that's a cost that we're forcing onto them. And there are things that we might do, like require all employers to pay a prorated share of vacation and, and health coverage for every hour of work. So get rid of that incentive for, for employers to treat people like independent contractors when they're really employees. That's one thing we could do. Um, and we're gonna have to think more about the changing nature of work going forward. I'll stop there. I hope that was useful. Feels like a bit of a rant or pontification. <laughs> it was good. <clears throat> don't mind me asking, what surprised you the most from these findings that you didn't know before? The number of people struggling. Yeah. Yeah. It makes a big yeah. difference when you incorporate the cost of housing and other right. basic needs. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, just sort of how different and more accurate this measure feels to the very baseline, just poverty line, which is both so outdated and just not the lack of regional specificity just makes it so not useful when you can see yeah. the extreme disparities yeah. even across the state. And the official poverty measure is pretty much outdated from the moment it was conceived. Absolutely. Yep. I think the key thing that um, the data are important, but the real thing that we want to get across with all this is when we have conversations with people, it should be about how can we help households live with dignity? And that's the, the focus of the household budgets is, you know, this is what we think, you know, a, 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 a single mom with a, uh, a uh, school-aged child and a toddler should be able to afford to live in with some dignity, shouldn't be sleeping on the couch, right? Um, and, you know, how do we do, how do we achieve that? Um, that is um, a much better conversation to have, we think, than how much money people don't have, right? And then the other thing, you know, the reason we showed the productivity chart is we can afford more. We can afford to support households. And the bright spots like I mentioned, like the state EITC, the federal child tax credits, those things do make a difference um, and we can afford to do them. <clears throat> I see Adam's question about uh, percent above the official poverty rate. We think it's about two and a half times the official federal poverty rate, right? So official federal poverty income level for a family of four, like we use all the time, I think is around 22,000 right, in LA County, um, you know, as you mentioned, when we started at the top and asked people how much you think housing costs, I'm not sure you can stay housed for 22,000 in many parts of the county, right, um, let alone eat, right, or, or deal with um, getting to work or paying your, your medical bills. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we're obviously challenged by now too is the COVID pandemic, right? And how all the interruptions in terms of our labor market and particularly with childcare has been impacting both families, not only below the real cost measure, but above the real cost measure as well. Whereas many families have had to interrupt how they work in order to take care of their children over the past year and a half. And we'll be taking a look at that data over time in future years. I was gonna ask how not to like move on from this report to the next report, but you know, just what you're thinking yeah. about how the, the method's gonna change both with the interruptions to the market, but also as Regina was yeah. alluding to with, you know, just all of the federal and state support that sometimes then throws off the percentage of, you know, are people yeah. falling here or not if they're being inflated? Oh. Yeah. Um, it's well, I mean, you know, hopefully, some of these things will become permanent. So like if the child tax credit becomes permanent, that's good, right? And then we would expect to see our real cost measure um, rates of struggling go down, right? Um, some amount, we would expect to see that impact. And we're rooting for that, right? Um, you know, uh, childcare costs, um, 
we hope will go down, right? Or become, you know, more uh, the um, availability of free childcare will increase. And so that would mean that fewer households are struggling too. We hope to see those things happen. Um, it's all in the balance right now <laughs> with the with the federal budget reconciliation bill, right? And it could go the other direction if 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 we don't do things right. Um, yeah. I don't know if that's answering your question, but yeah, yeah. And, and measuring the cost of living and well-being is also changes with the changes with the economy as well. So, go ahead. I was I, I was struck by the idea that I was playing around with some data yesterday around what's been happening with the stock market and giving and donors and how they're responding to this moment and. Um, I think Standard and Poor's went up for individuals about 6%. Giving went up about 5%. So there was 1% that people kept in their pockets if they were doing well last year, um, which kind of intrigued me as a, how do we um, get smarter in LA County about talking to the people that have money in their pockets to help the people that don't? So you guys are talking about the policy side because that is definitely where the big dollars are but there's also a lot of donors here in LA County that are doing really well right now. So I'm wondering if you're thinking, I mean, I'm curious for the people participating today, if some of this data can help make the case for your donors. Why giving matters now? You know, Regina, that, 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 that is a great point. You know, the, the data, data that I've seen that we're privy to at the bank, I can tell you that you know the stock market has been on a tear, and 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 the wealthy individuals, at least data that, that we've seen, wealthy individuals, literally over the last five years, have doubled their wealth. Doubled. Uh, uh, so when you when, when you're thinking about the wealthy individuals have increased their giving, if you will, by one percent. In essence, that's peanuts compared to the the wealth that they've accumulated just in the last couple of years. I mean, just this year alone, the stock market has set already, you know, 20 new record highs. So, uh, 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 and donations went up. People noticed that people were hungry. That that you know, there it seems like there's a moment for us. And I'm so excited about this data, Pete and Henry, because it seemed like part of why we wanted you guys here is we were hoping that the more we can share what's happening in LA County for real people, that some people are gonna to wanna to step up and dig a little deeper to help. Yep. Including yeah. the corporate side, Sal, to your point. Yep. No, no, yeah. I, I hear you. We, we, we have stepped, we have literally, we have doubled our charitable contributions budget. Uh, I mean, last year we, we lowered a bit because our profits were down, but this year now profits have picked up again in, in spite of the pandemic. And we're working through our budget now and I can tell you the number has increased significantly mm. yeah well um one other um thing i want to mention is there's a lot of conversation about universal basic income or guaranteed minimum income i think the city and i think la is uh, starting up a, a, a <laughs> universal basic in income pilot um we think those kind of things are good we support them i think um I prefer the guaranteed minimum income route. Um, you know, and I, we could geek out about what books to read about it. You know, there's all these pilots going on. You know, the benefits of it are proven. There's nothing to prove anymore. It works. The question is how to get it to scale. And for that, it's going to have to be federal and probably through the tax code at some point. Um, I also want to mention the notion of um, uh, universal basic capital. Um, you know, I had a conversation with Senator Hertzberg about it one time, and we're talking about universal basic income, and he shoots back, I want universal basic capital. And, you know, I think he's right. You know, we, this, we're a very prosperous state. I think we're the, are we like the fifth yeah. largest economy in the world now? The the state? And, yeah. um, you know, Alaska has a permanent fund. Everyone in Alaska gets a, gets a check. And so what if we started to build you know, our shared portfolio and let people share in the wealth a little bit is something to think about. Yeah. Yeah. Any of well, the last thoughts? 
we've really enjoyed this. I just want to thank everybody for listening and for, uh, we'd be happy to share this with um, any of your, if anybody's in, you know, wants us to share it with your staff or, you, you know, you're in um, uh, affinity groups or subsector groups, any, anywhere people are gathering, we'd be happy to help share this information. Uh, and just want to thank you again for, for listening. Thank you. Thanks. Good job. Thank you. This is so important. And you're right, so much more easy to see the real plight in the situation than the, the poverty level. Right? I think this is really, you know, should resonate with folks and understand that even though there's a lot of money that's been going out, it's not enough. We yeah. have so much work to do. Great. Well, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you all for joining. Um, we'll be wrapping it here. Hope everyone has a good uh, good weekend and we'll be sharing the recording and the slides and the links and the resources and everything that we talked about today. Um, so thanks for joining us. Great, thank you. Thank you, have a good afternoon. Thanks all, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.